thank you all uh, for coming to listen to me, folks. Um, it's uh, it's not often we do live events these days, so so great to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about web filtering, which is, I'm sure, a massive surprise to all of you because that's pretty much all I ever talk about. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more today about the technology because I know I've got a lot of technologists in the room. Um, so today, we're talking about it's not just proxies anymore, although, as the subtitle says, they are still everywhere. So here's our agenda. We're going to have a little look about how web filtering works in, in 2023. Um, it's changing, still changing, um, and the, the, the pace of change is probably as rapid as it's been in my 20 years of working with schools web filtering. I'm going to have a look at the different technologies that we use to, to, to protect our young people online and the ways those young people are trying to get around web filters because that's been a constant since the very first computer went into the very first school um, some student was trying to do something untoward with it. So let's just remind ourselves of the web filtering that we want to employ. So it's really easy to do web filtering badly, yeah? but it's pretty difficult to do it well. And the reason that we think about all these different technologies is that we want to be up here. I'm not, I don't want to know if the sticky cl clicker has a, has a laser pointer. I'm not even going to try it. We want to be up here with the 100% real-time content filtering. We want to be there so that sites that change get categorized correctly. We want to be there so that sites that have user-generated content get categorized correctly. We want to be there so the newest content that arrives online can get categorized correctly. We could be down the bottom here with no filtering, which would be a terrible place to be. Um, we could be using DNS filtering or URL filtering or non-real-time content aware filtering, but we want to be right up at the top, and so we want to aim our technologies to allow us to achieve that. So let's have a let's have a little dig in. Why are things changing? So a couple of reasons. One of the primary reasons that the methods that we use for content filtering are changing is the mobility of student devices. Laptops have been around in schools for a long time, but largely confined to trolleys weirdly laptops that have got a kind of 30 foot radius on them yeah. portable in name only but that's changing we're seeing more and more schools giving devices to, to students to take home or devices that stay with a student throughout the entire day i think that probably slightly accelerated by our experiences during the the lockdowns that have kept us away from edugeek conferences for a couple of years um, but that is accelerating and we see that following the trends that the us uh, follow with more and more one-to-one -one programs. So mobility of student devices is super important. Um, the increasing need for better and more granular filtering. So you'll see more and more that rather than go to a lot of different endpoints on the web, students go to actually fewer than ever. But those few places have more more varied content. So for example, YouTube is a huge um, suck for student eyeball. Sounded a bit weird, never mind. Um, but YouTube is, a, is now probably 10% uh, of all web requests in schools. And you know, that means there are, there are fewer and fewer domains that hit by students, but a lot more content seen. So we need that, that granular filtering. We also have got changing technologies like HTTP3, ESNI, DNS over HTTP. These are bothersome to our technology, and we'll see, about, see why in a moment. And of course, we've got our persistent students who've been evading filters for years and years and are getting better and better at it. So we'll start with those technology changes. Um, protocol changes are barely noticeable to users of the web. Yeah. Um, any of you folks in here would happen to pull up your phone or your laptop and go to a website. You probably couldn't tell me whether you're using plain old HTTP 1.1, HTTP2, Quick, HTTP3, you wouldn't notice. Um, if that site's behind Cloudflare, who uh, drew, drew this diagram here, and were uh, one of the architects of encrypted client hello, there's a good chance it is one of these um, newer protocols. And these newer protocols are not designed to be filtered. They're not designed for people to see inside. In fact, they're designed for price, precisely the opposite of that. A lot of the reason for adopting these new protocols, which, yeah, 
like quicks faster it's over udp so we can do things a bit quicker we can rely on our more reliable networks that we didn't have when we invented http it's a bit quicker but the main driving force behind all of these technologies you see here is privacy yeah so this is a this is encrypted client hello which what's an, what's a client hello well a client hello is where your web browser first speaks to a server and says i want to get to website x right now that's in the that's in the clear even for a for a secure HTTPS website, the client hello is in the clear. Um, so we can see where folks are going. With encrypted client hello, you can still put it, as you can see, non-encrypted in the white there, you can still put that on encrypted, but um, you can optionally move that server name into the encrypted portion. This makes it more and more difficult for a network-based device to see what's going on on that network. Um, and then down at the bottom there, DOH, DNS over HTTP. Again, if, oh, well, oh, it's just moving DNS onto a new transport stream. Ah, okay, that's cool. That's, you know, it's one less mode of transport to think about, but it's also encrypting it. It's DNS over HTTPS, not DNS over HTTP, it's DNS over HTTPS. It's encrypting the DNS. So if you want to look at students' DNS, try and work out where they're going, why they're going there, we can't do that. Some, some blight has encrypted it. Terrible times. Filter avoidance. This is evolving. We've got the old stuff. We've got the web app proxies we're all familiar with. So look at this one here, nebulaproxy.io, and I'm searching for online games. It's proxying Google through a different domain. Yeah. Um, so very, very similar um, to Glyp and Titanium, a PHP proxy. But there's been an evolution of those. They get cleverer and cleverer and include basically complete browser within browser functionality these days. Five, 10 years ago, these were a dreadful thing. You could get, you could use them just. Now it's a really great experience going through these proxies um, and they're becoming harder and harder to block. Um, students are using VPNs, particularly if they've got their own devices, um, use commercial VPNs like NordVPN or some students will homebrew their own, their own with something like OpenVPN. Protocol misuse, here's a fun one. And I don't want to, uh, encourage people to try things like port scanning. I mean, that would be bad, yeah, um, Chris? We shan't do that. Um, but iodine is quite a lot of fun. That's actually routing web traffic over DNS. It's a great way. Um, if you're behind something that's blocking like a hotel Wi-Fi or something, it's a great way to route web traffic out, out of that. Um, but students also put their own iodine servers up there too to try and route past our filters. Uh, domain fronting. Spoke a bit about that at the last edit conference, I think. Um, another route past, past filters. And of course, the dreaded hotspotting students connecting the Wi-Fi to the Wi-Fi from their mobile phones, should they be allowed them in the, in the school, and using that to, to avoid the filtering. One thing I'd like to point out is finding bypasses online is actually getting harder. It used to be super easy to type bypass smooth wall and you'd find a load of sites that didn't work. Yeah, Hard luck, but never mind. But today, you'll find there's tons of malware in there. If you type unblocked games into Google, a lot of the sites will offer you something that looks like it might unblock games, but it's actually distributing malware. A lot of the sites that do host these proxies, they need to make money. A lot of them host malware. So it's actually pretty dangerous. It's pretty similar to if you go looking for free sports streams, for example. That's a, that's a terrible search to make because that will, that's, that will lead you into a, a part of the web that's just riddled with malware. So where, where were we? Filters, filters, filters. Let's start with network level filters. What's a network level filter? It's a device that filters the web on the network. Um, one device looks after many clients and it's the traditional way to do things in UK schools. But we've heard that those, that traditional way to do things is under threat from device mobility from new protocols. Yeah. So there are three different types of network level filter. There's the proxy, there's a packet filter and there's a DNS filter. Of those, the first two need a physical piece of hardware and the latter generally would piggyback on a piece of hardware you already had in your, your school. So talk about quickly about the, these types, the traditional proxy, it's sometimes in line, it's sometimes it's decrypting, it's sometimes it's a content filter. It's deployed within a school network or sometimes at multi-academy trust or LEA level and sometimes it's deployed in the cloud. But these are still proxies. When we look at the avoidance techniques, proxies are actually pretty good using content filters, firewall rules, search checking to get past the first three types of avoidance. But hotspotting is clearly a problem for proxy because 
when someone's network traffic goes a different direction to your to your network proxy, you're going to get straight around it. Packet filters, not so usual in, in the UK, seem a, seem a bit in the US. Um, indeed, as part of the wider Coria brand, we have a, we have a packet filtering um, web filter uh, that we deploy in the US. Uh, not as good against web application proxies because these rarely decrypt SSL and almost never content filter. But similarly, they're deployed in a school network. Um, on the other hand, they're quite good at VPN and protocol misuse because generally those sort of firewall rules can be baked into these packet filters. But still, because these kind of thing, filters are on network, they're vulnerable to hotspotting. And the final type of on network filter is the DNS filter. Now, we rarely see these in UK schools because DNS filters aren't particularly effective because as as, as the name implies, they only filter at that domain level. And we talked about earlier, the number of domains visited by students is contracting and the amount of different content on those domains is expanding. So DNS filters aren't particularly useful for student devices. Um, never any SSL capability, little star there. There are the occasional vendor who'll give you a DNS filter that redirects some of its traffic to a proxy in the cloud to do SSL decrypt. I like to call that the worst of both worlds. Um, Authentication ditto, very, very difficult um, uh, or, or none at all. Never any content filtering, limited logging, and this encrypted DNS and DNS over HTTP is a looming issue for DNS filters. It's just only usually deployed in schools as a catch-all, um, and uh, you know it's uh, it's vulnerable against hotspotting being on the network. It's very vulnerable to web application proxies, and um, you need to work hard to avoid VPNs and, and, and protocol misuse. So let's have a look now at on-device filters. What is an on-device filter? I don't have a picture for this. You can't really see it. It actually lives on the laptop or on the, on the iPad or on the student's device. Um, the filter is responsible for only that device. Okay? Unlike a network filter, which is responsible for all the devices in the network, an on-device filter is responsible for precisely one device, the device on which it's installed. An on-device filter will move with the device so that it works off-site. So it's not tied to the network in the same way as our traditional proxy filters or packet filters are tied to the network. It will work off-site. And this type of filter has actually been around a long time. It's not been particularly prevalent in commercial or education settings because in those settings, a proxy filter or network-level filter has been, um, has been adequate. But it's been often used in parental control. So most parental control software sits on, on a young person's device. Um, we are now uh, working with our, our new part of the, the, the group of companies, uh, Custodio. So Custodio is a parental control software organization, became part of the Coria group, I think, last year. Um, so we're working with them to share technology because the technology that's been used in parental control is actually really useful in controlling the web usage within schools. So there are four different types. And oddly, you'll see that the four different types actually correlate pretty neatly in the first three to the types of filter that we've seen on a network. Why is this? Well, the reason is because when people built these technologies, they built them in order to, to satisfy the needs of mobility. And they just thought, I'll tell you what, we'll take what we're doing on the network and we'll cram it onto a device. And that works to a degree. So let's have a look at these four different types. So the four different types. We start with the on-device proxy. It really is what it says on the tin. Someone taking all that technology that lives in that network edge box and putting it onto a student's device. Um, this works pretty well, but it needs usually some fair horsepower on that device, although you know, getting less, less of a problem over time as devices get more powerful. Um, how would you recognize it if you see 127.0.1 in your proxy settings in your browser? Or most certainly then something on that device is proxying your traffic from that browser. That's the, um, that's the straightforward and easy way to get traffic um, from uh, a browser on device into a local proxy is simply to point it at the at loop back and run a proxy on there. 
very, very similar to the way that you, some of you might have deployed a trad proxy in the in, in a network environment, where you point it to the proxy's IP address. Same same deal. You're just pointing it to a to a local proxy. Much like traditional proxies, sometimes you see man in the middle, and sometimes you see content filtering. Much like traditional proxies, they work in most browsers. Browsers are set up to use proxies. They know about these things. It generally works uh, fine on most browsers. But it does still require some lockdown software choices. If someone's able to bring a browser on there, onto that machine that isn't within your control, then of course they don't get to use the proxy. <coughs> we might be able to block them from accessing the web, but it does require a bit of lockdown software choices. It does, however, amplify the issues of network proxies. Whereas with a network proxy, if you've got downtime or issues, it probably affects your whole network. Um, with the on-device proxy, it will only affect one or two machines, but it does tend to amplify those issues around SSL, man in the middle, and the on-device proxy has similar issues in terms of new protocols. So a proxy has to understand all the protocols that are up there, your quicks, your HTTP threes, and so forth. Um, so if it doesn't understand those, we have to either not use them yeah, or have a proxy which understands them, which, which is much more complicated. Also suffers those same uh, limitations as we find more and more privacy enhancing protocols out there. Um, these proxies um, do suffer with that. As you can see though, we now for the first time have no major problems in our avoidance. So. We can still use our content filters to look at those web application proxies like Glyph and Titanium and, uh, and Nebula. Um, other browsers are okay as long as they're locked down. Um, Non-browser traffic, um, we've got limited or no control about that. Um, but we can uh, maybe uh, make some exceptions for it. And hotspotting and VPN and protocol misuse all now become no problem because all methods of circumventing our network um, and using a different network transport suddenly become no problem because we're not looking at the network, we're looking locally. Similarly, an on-device packet filter um, is same same method as, as on-device proxy, but without setting a proxy, we're using something like uh, the technology behind IBM Superlayer, for those of you who remember their horrible uh, brush with uh, with pushing advertising onto IBM laptops uh, and trying to packet sniff all your traffic and push advertising to you that got them into so much trouble. Those technologies still exist for um, for the purpose of, of, of safety and, and filtering. But usually we only see things at DNS level. Very rarely see any decryption or an on-device packet filter. Again, likely to have these problems with newer protocols. But on the plus side for a packet filter, it works on all browsers. Yeah. So locking down is not as necessary because the packet filter is working at the very basic network level on that device. It doesn't matter whether it's Firefox or Chrome or Edge. It doesn't matter whether the browsing traffic is coming from another piece of software like PowerPoint, for example. So non-browser traffic is no problem to the on-device packet filter. And again, hotspotting VPN protocol misuse is no problem. We're on the device. Third type, on-device DNS. So this is again doing the same thing as a DNS filter. That's changing our DNS server, pointing the DNS server at somewhere else that's going to give us a different answer when we hit a blocked site. So a DNS filter, when I type in 888.com, it goes, uh-oh, that's gambling. And it's going, instead of redirecting me to the IP address of 888.com, it's gonna give me a, an IP address of a, of a block page. Unfortunately, you can only do things at DNS level again. So if you're doing, on device DNS, you're going to struggle with web app proxies because you can't you can't use your content filtering to 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 uh, to ameliorate that that issue because there's no decryption. Um, it's protocol agnostic. It's likely to be able to avoid DOH issues. Um, works in all browsers, so non-browser traffic's no problem. Other browsers, no problem. Very very much at the network level. Very simple. Very straightforward. And of course, hotspotting again. All these as is. The same with all our on-device uh, types of filtering. Those things are no problem at all. So what we've seen there is, is the first three, which, which mirror the three things that folks are doing on network. There's a fourth method. Um, so the fourth method is brand new, uh, which is using an extension in browsers. So browser extensions 
haven't been around for a hugely long time, maybe 10 years, um, and browser extensions that actually can do a lot have been down for a little, uh, been around for a little less than that. Uh, so the idea of a browser extension is that we take the filtering software and we bake it into the browser using that using the APIs that the browser manufacturers give us um, to adjust the content in that browser. So the great things about this, we've got access to the URL, we've got access to content without any decryption. We don't need to think about man in the middle or certificates or any of that horror because we've got access to exactly what the student's seeing. We've got no problems with newer protocols because um, we've, we receive the data post network, post protocol. So it could be quick, it could be HTTP3, it could be whatever brand spanking new thing there is exist. It could be over a VPN, could be tunneled over an IID and DNS proxy. Nobody cares because we see the data then in the browser. So right just before it hits the student eyeball. Too many eyeball references. Note to self, don't do that. Um, so no problems with newer protocols. Um, it does need explicit browser support, however. So obviously, when you have an extension to a browser, the browser's got to support all the things that extension wants to do. More and more, we're seeing all the browsers shift towards the same kind of workings with extensions, the same kind of uh, APIs and, and, and ways of working. So they're, they're compatible, but it's not the case that you can take a, an extension from Google and stick it into Firefox. It is the, generally the case you can take it and stick it into Edge, because Edge is super, super similar to Chrome but it's not the case that you can stick it into Firefox or Safari or, or some of the other more niche browsers like Opera. So it does need explicit support from the browser um, and it does need locking down to avoid kind of rogue browsers, people bringing on something without the extension. So the good news is um, we can straightforwardly filter our web app proxies with the content filter. <clears throat> other browsers may not be supported. Non-browser traffic, uh, we're in trouble because this is in the browser. Um, but hotspotting, VPN, and all that malarkey again, no problem. Right, so it's a lot, wasn't it? Got a lot of things, a lot of things swirling around in this big maelstrom of, um, of filtering technologies. Um, I think many of you will have more than one technology in your organization uh, to, to filter. I mean, by by show of hands, who 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 knows they've got a, a traditional proxy at the edge of the school? Yeah, good a goodly number. Uh, and again, show of hands, let's say who's got anything on a device for filtering? Arguably as many, arguably as many. So what we're seeing here is not that one is to the exclusion of another, yeah, um, or that um, one is then the sequel to the other or the, the or the next generation or anything like that what we're seeing is people are using everything bits bits of everything where it's appropriate and that is exactly what we should be doing nothing as we've seen is the champion of the lot there's nothing that has no problems so when we want the maximum you know remember back to our filtering pyramid where we want the maximum quality of filtering, we need to use different things in different places. According to the technologies that we have in our organization, it's gonna be according to the type of filtering. If a laptop's going to leave the building, we're gonna to need to think about filtering that isn't network-based. If something is only going to be used by adults, we might not need to go for the real-time content filter. We might be able to say, hey, this is a smart TV. We just need to block various, you know, Netflix and a few things off it and then block YouTube entirely. So we could probably get away with DNS filtering on that. So we've got to use the technologies cleverly. And this is actually, I mean, the diagram is pretty hard to read, so I apologize for that because it's, it's super not obvious what's going on, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk you through it. Um, this, is, this is how Smoothwall plans to pull these technologies together. So on our student-owned laptop, which, you know, if you can just, some of laptops are really thin these days, so you draw, draw a laptop on a diagram, it looks like a sheet of paper. Um, give us an old-school laptop with a massive keyboard and a proper chunky mouse nipple in the middle of it. That's worse than eyeballs, isn't it? 
Ah, I'm, I'm not doing well today. Um, so this is the laptop over at the, uh, the left-hand side there. And on that laptop, we put both the extension. It's a little puzzle piece in case you were confused. Both the extension on the browser so we can get that absolute granular level of filtering within browser. And we also put one of the other techniques on there. Yeah? So for non-browser traffic, which we know is the Achilles heel of the extension, we'll take another technique. Like we might take DNS on device because DNS on, device, DNS on device is pretty lightweight, it's pretty protocol agnostic, and it covers all the traffic that's not on the browser. So with two things like that on device, we can make that device really proof against uh, inappropriate browsing. However, there are always devices we can't install stuff on. This will inevitably be the case. It might be the smart TVs I was just talking about. It might be mobile devices that aren't controlled by the school. Um, any sort of device that isn't controlled by the school is always going to be a sticky wicket for, for getting anything onto it. So in that case, we do still need our network level filtering. So we, when we've got our network level filtering, we can pick up BYO, we can pick up guest devices, we can pick up unmanaged, we can pick up smart TV, signage, all that sort of thing, and make sure that's still getting a level of filtering. It's our belief that over time, we will see the device at the edge of the network get simpler it will do less decryption of traffic because on devices which we are capable of decrypting the traffic, we will already have our agents, our deployed software on those devices, and they will be getting a better level of filtering than you could ever have hoped for with a network edge device. Better authentication, more granular filtering, <clears throat> more granular reporting from those agents on the device. But whilst ever there are unmanaged devices, Whilst ever there are um, devices which we can't install software on, there'll still be a need for on, on, on network filtering. So the, for us, the vision of the future of filtering is not one thing, it's a combination of things. Anyone who tries to tell you one thing is probably telling you that because it's the only thing they have. So be, be super careful with that. So that gets us to, for managed devices, a browser extension for full visibility without one in the middle, a DNS agent or similar to pick up the rest of the traffic, minimally locked down, maximum protection. For those unmanaged devices, an edge-based inline filter for the maximum visibility you're gonna get for unmanaged devices, optional authentication, but accurate logging. <clears throat> so with something like DNS filtering, picking up the slack, you might not get that accurate logging and optional authentication, which is why we believe the presence of a device on that network, be it at the edge of the school network, be it within an ISP's data center like the good folks at Schools Broadband or EXA, for example, or be it at um, the a central data center owned by the, a trust, somewhere there, there's something monitoring that network traffic and acting as a fallback and picking that up. So that is the, the separation, managed or unmanaged. Managed and ultimately mobile, devices we send with, an, with, our, with our agents or managed devices well when they come on to our network or where they're, where they're always on our network we'll manage them with an edge-based inline filter so that's about me done um, and I hope I've gained us a little bit of time back um, I went for batting on through those early slides Chris um, try and gain us a bit of time back uh, I'd be happy to take some questions until Chris tells me to get lost <laughs> well, I've caught you up a bit. Alan. Um, in your last, the last, last, next to last slide, you mentioned edge inline. Is that Microsoft Edge? As in edge of network inline. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, Microsoft keep calling things things that they shouldn't call them and making things confusing. See so also their product DevOps. Yeah, they shouldn't do that, but they do. Okay, uh, gentleman with the beard there. Uh, in regards to like YouTube, what, what kind of level of filtering, how granular can you go that can allow specific YouTube videos and then, and then block the rest? Or? Abs absolutely. So with, with YouTube, um, you know, we can go pretty specific. Um, I think that's going to be a, a place where all filter vendors will be making improvements over the next 
next few years as YouTube just gets bigger and bigger. So right now, you know, you can go down to that specific video level, but I can see a time in the not too far future where even on a, a fairly basic Chromebook, we've got the juice to do some real analysis of, of what's going on with those, with those YouTube videos. So I think it's a, an exciting time in, in filtering, you know, being able to get that power onto, onto that device. You know, you imagine your, your network edge device, um, it might have a, a pair of Xeon processors in it, but behind that network edge, there might be 500,000 student devices and growing. Um, the share of CPU time each of those can can devote from that network edge device is pretty, pretty tiny. Whereas if we actually take a bit of CPU time from each device, as that scales, we scale up our CPU almost sort of for free. Um, and using that extra power we've got, and as those devices get more and more capable, uh, we'll be able to do more and more um, on that. So I can, I can see in the future as well, um, more in-depth and granular filtering coming out of, out of YouTube. Um, chat with the blue top there. So iOS. Yes ios discuss um you can see all you have to say to me is ios <laughs> yeah now ios is always a, always a challenging one um so ios devices have a, they broadly have a tendency to be managed but actually in 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 many schools have a tendency to be only half managed uh, because a lot of ipads in the uk have been brought into schools perhaps without a great deal of consultation with with IT, um, which is something the latest Kixi standards tell us we really shouldn't be doing. You know, as teaching and learning need new devices, they need to need to think about how that works with IT and how that works with the DSLs, how we bring these devices in safely. So we've got a lot of iPads in schools which are just stashed in the corner of a classroom, um, sitting on a trolley, and they're just picked up willy-nilly uh, by students. Leads us to a few problems. This problem of authentication. Yeah, there's a chap called Tim at the back there who's always moaning about iPads um, and trying to authenticate. So, if we are going to successfully alert when a user visits a site that they shouldn't be doing, or when a user is being monitored and exhibiting uh, dangerous behaviours, we need to know who they are. It's really challenging on an iPad, and it's even more challenging when iPads are delivered like that. And that is the case in a lot of schools. So. We already have a kind of um, a um, you know a compromise to make when we're talking about iOS. Going forward, we do need to be putting an agent on our iOS devices. With the modern versions of iOS, even if you put a certificate on there and you're doing network edge filtering, you'll find that there are lots of apps that don't behave very well. Um, you'll find that there are some things that simply don't work with it, and it's it's, it's kind of a pain. You you end up unlocking websites for the, for the cows come home. So definitely putting a putting an agent on iOS is is the way forward. Quite what that agent looks like right now in smooth wall world, we can't put a browser plugin into an iOS browser. So quite simply, no browsers on iOS support plugins. Um, so we to build our own filter into a browser. So we had to take Firefox and build our filter into it because it was the only way to get a filter into a browser. We're also working on adding that backstop of DNS to iPads to filter everything else. Um, so iPads will follow the same pattern as I've described for everything else. Um, it's just that pattern is slightly harder to follow because our pals at Apple really, like, they don't give us the inroads into their operating system as, um, <coughs> as Microsoft or, or even Chromebooks do. Um, and again, the reason for that is that Apple are, are very focused on privacy. And when you've got an iPad that belongs to you and sat on your coffee table, you want that privacy. You know, it's a massive feature for for the home user. Not such a good feature when we, uh, we're trying to keep students safe in schools. Okay, we've got a chap at the back in the white shirt there. So the other sort of challenge there, you mentioned iOS, you go bring your own device. What's your best, best endeavors at the minute? What does it look like? Bring your own device depends on who's bringing it, what the device is. Um, so I hate to give the de it depends answer, but it is very much an it depends answer. Um, I would, yeah, I would suggest that, 
Yeah, I would suggest that um, still the way to deal with bringing your own devices filtering at the network edge. You're not going to get much onto a onto a BYO device. Uh, if you are super lucky, you might get a certificate on there. You know, particularly if that device is something that isn't a mobile phone, um, you might get a certificate on there to be able to do some MITM at the network edge. In terms of authentication, if those devices are student owned and being brought into the school regularly, 802.1x is the place to be with authentication there. That's the only reliable way you'll get authentication. And we at the minimum, if it's a student device, we need authentication. Because I said, if someone visits, a site that's concerning and all we've got is an IP address well as the IT folks in the room know chasing down an IP address is no fun it takes time when a DSL gets an alert they want a username next to it so authentication is a must for student devices so absolutely would want 802.1x out there for authentication on the BYO and for me uh, some sort of decryption man in the middle in order to see things uh, just at least Google search terms is, is kind of essential. Um, so ideally, I'd, I'd be uh, onboarding those devices at the start of the year and getting a certificate on them. Our challenges as we come to this is the next stage of the evolution in, in certificates in HTTPS is that they will have a validity of 90 days, uh, which will be significantly unpleasant for those types of for operations. So yes, our lives are being made harder on that front. Yes, our lives are being made harder because other people want privacy and security baked in, which is the right thing to do. So I can't even complain too hard about it. Um, but BYO is a it's a challenging place to be. Um, but uh, you know, we'll, we and, uh, and I'm sure the other vendors here will support you as much as we possibly can in that. I've got a question from the internet. Oh, not yeah, the yeah. internet. I it's... hate the internet. <sighs> Do you? <laughs> <laughs> You picked the right career then. It's from Tony Shepard, actually. Um, he asks, what do you think of the DFE's requirements about filtering? What do I think about the DFE's requirements about filtering? Um, is Tony wearing a, a tiger face right this very minute? His avatar is. <laughs> okay, that'll do. In that case, I will answer. I think the DFE's requirements about filtering are by far and away the best bits of legislation around filtering in the world. We are so far ahead of every other country when it comes to regulating student safety on the internet. However, there is a long way to go. Um, the DFE will always struggle. I don't think it's, it's right to see governments and, and, and lawmakers as kind of calcified, you know, old, old people who don't understand the technology and and can never keep up because even something like Kixi that changes every year, um, you know, still oh, I can't keep up. What use is it making these rules? Well, I think actually what we've got is we've got rules that that are implemented pretty well um, in that they don't specify technology, they specify goals and outcomes. And the folks at the Safer Internet Centre do an absolutely fantastic job of filling that gap and suggesting how technology might achieve those goals and outcomes. Uh, it is deeply imperfect, but it's the best anybody's got at the moment. And um, myself and another few of the vendors who are around around here are working with the government, with the Safer Internet Centre, to make sure that these things make sense, that they work for schools, that they work for students, because that's the that's the important thing. You know, to look at what I would say is some less good advice. If you look at the advice around cyber security for schools that's coming out of the government. It's been very much a, oh, panic, schools want, to, want help with cyber security. What will we do? Let's take the best practices from corporate and whack them into the school setting. Doesn't work. Sorry, schools are different. Just, you know, that's not gonna work. Luckily, the DFE have obviously got hold of the Kixi stuff. Those guys mostly know schools. Um, the, the civil servants um, working those are, are excellent people. They know their business. They do a good job, um, and we're thankful for them. No more questions? Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Tom. That's been very, a very, very informative presentation. Happy five minutes back. Now's your round of applause. <laughs> thanks, folks.